So uh, greetings. My name is Jim Beiser. I'm a professor of climate adaptation and international development in the School of Natural Resources and the Environment. And I serve as the interim director of a new university-wide unit called the Arizona Institutes for Resilience, which consists of a total of 11 institutes, centers, and programs. And we work with all colleges across the university. Today, I'll serve as your moderator for this webinar. First of all, I want to thank uh, everyone and welcome everyone uh, eh, who is joining today in this large session. We will hear from eight presenters about their research and outreach and environment. To learn more about, what, about these presenters, please check out their bios on, an, on uh, the AIR Environment webpage. And Maya, if you'd put that up in the chat, then people will have it. Thank you. This webinar is brought to you by the School of Earth and Environmental Sciences, which is a federation of units uh, that produce knowledge about earth and environmental processes and human environment interactions at all geographic and temporal scales. SEAS, as is known, faculty and researchers provide the scientific basis for environmental and climate policy, train the next generation of scientists, and disseminate knowledge and solutions for the benefit of society. Today, I'll take uh, just a minute to introduce each speaker before they speak, and then each of the speakers will have five minutes to present. Maya Patterson will serve as the host or the director, and she'll manage the screens. I'll uh, ask all speakers to use uh, the speaker view and, and to keep your video on uh, gallery view. So um, if the panelists also would mute themselves when not presenting. The plenary will be recorded um, and a, including the breakout sessions, uh, which I'll tell you about in a second. If you have questions during the next hour, please use the uh, question and answer, the Q&A function. We'll try to get them answered via the chat during the session, but you'll also have an opportunity to ask these questions in breakout sessions. So the breakout sessions will begin at four o'clock and you'll need to make your way to a separate uh, Zoom meeting. So if you, uh, th these will be put up in the chat and you'll have the links, take a look at the titles and their descriptions and, uh, and then uh, it, make sure that you record uh, that link because that's where you'll wanna go at the end of this session. So first, I'd like to introduce our very first uh, presenter, uh, Kevin Bonine. Dr. Kevin Bonine, is the Director of Education and Outreach at the Biosphere 2 and on the science faculty at the University of Arizona. His background includes herpetology, ecology, evolutionary physiology, and conservation biology. In addition to teaching undergraduate courses in these fields and also in the Galapagos marine ecology, um, he strives to share the importance of science, including the process and key findings with the public and K through 12 uh, students and educators. Uh, just as a note for you students, he often uh, complements his classroom with field components. Kevin also serves on the board of several local organizations, including the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum. Dr. Bonine. Thank you, Jim, very much. I'm excited to be here and hoping that I can get this to display effectively. Are we seeing the full slide? So I'd like to share with you a little bit about Biosphere 2, which is a unique uh, asset and resource that we have here at the University of Arizona. And the concept behind Biosphere 2 is, do we know enough to replicate how the planet works, how Earth systems function? Can we make those inside of something separate and distinct from Biosphere 1, our planet Earth? And if we think about the motivations, uh, some of it is conservation, environmental health, our own personal health, and some of it is exploring the solar system. So if you happen to see the movie The Martian, right, the goal here is to grow potatoes. And uh, if you think about what you need for that, it actually starts to get pretty complicated. You need the right temperature, you need water, you need carbon dioxide, you need light, uh, you need nutrients. And um, watch the movie if you don't know where he's getting his nutrients because it's kind of a fun part of the story. The idea behind Biosphere 2 was three acres of infrastructure separated from 
Biosphere One and multiple biomes. So not only producing food to support people, but also um, keeping a desert going, keeping a rainforest going, keeping an ocean going. And this is, this is challenging to do. If we think about the people, they were trying to grow calories and they were trying to grow oxygen, both products of photosynthesis. And they chose the desert setting because of the sunlight. And not everything went as planned. So if you look here, you see the oxygen concentration was going down. Oxygen was pumped in at about day 500. Uh, people were not getting enough food. This is one of the eight folks inside. The reasons why the oxygen went down are interesting and I'll share that with you some other time when you come visit our facility. But one of the things that came to mind after looking at all this was the importance of ecosystem services or nature services. What are these things that the planet provides that we value and need but sometimes take for granted. So it took a, a two acres or so of infrastructure underneath three acres of Biosphere 2 to make this place work. And people also started thinking quickly about how valuable this was for studying the impacts of a changing planet, because you can make Biosphere 2 look like 2040, 2050, and see how the systems respond. We've really changed the carbon cycle, and that has lots of implications. And to study that, we have this tool up the road about an hour from campus with measurement scale and control capacities unparalleled anywhere else for understanding how the planet works. We can study the rainforest and uh, a recent research campaign in the fall looked at the carbon cycle in, in very special detail, looking at the biochemistry of what happens to plants under drought and high temperature conditions. We have an ocean that uh, helped us better understand how uh, carbon dioxide causes acidification, which makes it, makes it challenging for corals to grow. Um, you also have increasing temperatures. And when you put these things together, it's kind of hard to figure out how corals are gonna survive into the future. So studying coral resilience and how to make that a reality is something that we can look at and manipulate at Biosphere 2 and uh, is hard to do elsewhere. The flagship project is called the Landscape Evolution Observatory. This is what the University of Arizona invested in at Biosphere 2 that arguably couldn't be done anywhere else and involved folks from multiple disciplines, including uh, many of the disciplines included in this webinar series today. And connecting these dots, connecting uh, soil, energy, carbon, water, all of these are complex and you need a place where you can have that complexity but enough control to see what's actually going on. Feeding the future is another motivating factor. I started with that slide of the Martian and uh, growing potatoes and terraforming Mars, but there's lots of interest in trying to figure out how we would grow food in a place like uh, the moon or Mars. And we have some prototype units at Biosphere 2 for doing this kind of research and for captivating the public. Part of what we do at Biosphere 2 is educate folks about the science we do and why it's so important. We have a massive open online course that's available right now for free with uh, thousands of people learning about how the earth works using Biosphere 2 as a hook. And we are rolling out a new course for undergraduates, a 300 level course that will be available in the fall of 2021. Biosphere 2 Science from Wonder to Discovery. We're very excited about this. We have participation from um, six or seven different colleges, and it's just gonna be a fabulous overview of how science works and how earth systems research can happen at Biosphere 2. And so many great colleagues at the U of A are involved in this. We also are launching a new minor for folks in the Honors College, Future Earth Resilience, which is looking at earth systems uh, how we value those and innovation, technology, and design to either make those things more resilient or to replicate them. So I encourage you, as you go through your years at the U of A, reach out to us at Biosphere 2, get connected to these courses, and uh, we're so excited to have you on board. And this is really a fabulous place for studying the environment. Uh, the U of A, Southern Arizona, Biosphere 2, and you picked a great spot and uh, you have a couple of years to figure out exactly where you want to focus your efforts, but get as much experience as you can along the way. Thanks very much. Well, thank you, Kevin. This is great. Um, I'm going to move on to the next speaker. Uh, professor Bo Guo is an assistant professor in hydrology and atmospheric sciences. 
His uh, expertise is in modeling uh, flow in permeable earth materials with fo a focus on understanding the fundamental physics of fluid flow at a pore scale, developing predictive computational models at a field scale to address practical engineering problems for energy and environmental systems, for example, in subsurface, uh, such as shale gas and oil production, uh, geological CO2 storage, contaminant transport in soil. Uh, Dr. Guo? Yes, I'm trying to share the screen now. How many did you lose? 190. 190 cows. You tell me, nothing's wrong here. It's a small matter for a family friend. Help a guy who needs it. The farmer or you? That's chemicals, I'm telling you. I'm seeing documents I don't understand. They're hiding something. That chemical. What if you drank it? Drank it? It's like saying, what if I swallowed a tire? What if whatever's killing those cows is in the drinking water? At DuPont, better living through chemistry. It's our DNA. You need to tell me what in the hell's going on. DuPont is knowingly poisoning 70,000 local residents for the last 40 years. This video actually is a very interesting um, a movie uh, trailer about, uh, you know, about the uh, chemicals, uh, PFAS, and a lawsuit against uh, DuPont. So, so basically, you know, uh, the, the, the topic that I'm going to talk about today is, a, a, you know, um, a group of emerging contaminant PFAS. And so you may ask, like, what are they? You know, PFAS are a group of chemicals referred to as uh, per and polyfluoro alcohol, alcohol substances. And I'm showing you uh, an example um, of the molecular structure um, of, uh, of an example PFAS, which is PFOS. As you can see from this molecular structure, it has a, a, hydro, uh, has, has a head group and a long um, tail, right? So the head group turns out to be hydrophilic, which means that it likes water. And the long tail is actually hydrophobic and oleophobic, which means that it does not like water or oil. So as you can imagine, when you put these chemicals into water, right, you know, they would like to hang out at the air water interfaces because that's where, you know, they can be thermodynamically stable. And there are some additional properties of this, um, um, of this type of chemicals is that they are extremely persistent. They don't readily break down in the natural environment and they are toxic at extremely low concentrations at parts per trillion levels. And to make it worse, it's not only one of them, it's there are more than 4,000 types of PFAS released to the environment and they all have very different uh, properties, okay? So these all uh, interesting properties makes them um, uh, unique from traditional contaminants. So PFAS have been actually widely used in our day-to-day -day life and in military, at military sites since the 1940s. It has been used for lung stick, stain and water resistant coating and for food packaging and for firefighting forms. In essence, they are perfect chemicals, if not toxic, okay? Um, so because of the large scale manufacturing and wide use, PFAS are now widely spread in the environment, in the surface water, sediment, soils, and groundwater. It was estimated that there are more than 110 million US residents are impacted, and the numbers will probably grow as more contaminated sites are uh, discovered, okay? so. Um, as a hydrologist like me, you know, the question that interests me is what are the important processes that will, that will influence where PFAS end up, okay? Um, so to help us to understand this problem, we will put together a conceptual uh, framework. Um, basically, you know, uh, as you can imagine, right, when the PFAS are released to the land surface, um, they would infiltrate through the soil and then eventually get down to groundwater. However, as we know from the slides before, um, you know, PFAS, most of them are surfactants. So they would like to hang out at the air water interfaces, which means that it would like, like to hang out in the soil, right, in the soil. So, so now the question is how can we incorporate these complex uh, processes in computer models for us to predict how PFAS move in the subsurface, okay? Uh, because, you know, it's important for us to predict when they will reach the groundwater, all right? Um, so we do that by solving a bunch of uh, differential equations. I don't know why my slides are just moving forward. Um, 
So we do that by solving a bunch of partial differential equations. Don't worry, I'm not going to any of these details. The key point of, of this slide is to show that mathematics actually can be useful and important for us to understand environmental uh, problems. Okay, so spend enough time with your math courses in the U of A. Um, and so, you know, by skipping all of these technical details, I'm going to directly show you uh, the, the, the results from the computer model. So here I'm showing you the downward migration of PFOS in the soil. Um, and on the, on the left um, is the results um, where we have the accumulation of air water, you know, accumulation of PFOS at air water interfaces included. As you can see, the PFOS migrates very slowly, right? You know, even after several decades, it hasn't reached the groundwater table at four meters. Um, and on the right, uh, the simulations are produced when we turn off this accumulation process. As you can see, it migrates much faster and it arri arrives at the groundwater even after two years. Okay, so this tells us the air water interfacial absorption significantly slows down the downward migration of PFOS in soils. Okay, and the implication of this simulation results actually are huge because it basically says that the soils will be a long term reservoir of PFOS and, uh, you know, they are basically ticking time bombs. All right. Um, so and the question, the practical question is whether we should remediate groundwater or as, as we have been always doing, or should we actually remediate soils because that's where most of the PFAS are and will be in the next few decades. Okay, so this research actually was uh, covered by various news media since publication, um, pointing out the importance of soils as reservoirs of these emerging contaminants. And uh, as you can see, you know, this is really just the beginning of this PFAS issue. And, uh, and you know, if you're interested, you're more than welcome to take the courses that, um, that I offer, um, Vedo Zone Hydrology and Numerical Methods for Environmental Transport Problems. And um, it'll be great to have you um, in our topic. Thanks. Thank you very much, Bo. Uh, now moving on to our next speaker, uh, Dr., uh, Dr. Andrea Gerlach. She's a research professor at the Udall Center for Studies in Public Policy and a professor in the School of Geography, uh, Development, and uh, the Environment. It, her research focuses on institutions for governing water resources. She examines cooperation and conflict around water, including questions of institutional change and adaptation to climate change in river basins and human rights and equity issues in water governance. Andrea? Thanks so much, Jim. Um, again, I'm Andrea Gerlach. I'm in the School of Geography and Development. I'm so happy to be with you here today. As Jim mentioned, my work is around the human dimensions of the environment. So I'm a social scientist, so I'm interested in people, in humans. So whether I'm studying conflict in the Mekong River Basin over dam construction or how we're dealing with drought in the Colorado River Basin, these are the sorts of questions that I'm looking at. How are we, how can we create institutions that solve problems, that represent diverse interests, that engage people, that resolve conflict, and that reflect justice and equity concerns. I'd like to just highlight one area of my research that you can see in my research and my teaching here at U of A. And let me advance the screen. It's around green infrastructure. And green infrastructure is an approach to protect and restore or mimic the natural water cycle. It's often thought of in contrast to gray infrastructure, like the traditional pipes that you see in your house that bring water into your house. And so we often see green infrastructure um, in rain gardens or ro green roofs or in green belts or urban parks. And Tucson is a great leader in green infrastructure. We've received all sorts of awards nationally and internationally, and we're a great laboratory for how green infrastructure happens, how it unfolds here. And some of these pictures are from around town and even my own backyard. One of the things that I've been doing is studying what the policy environment looks like around green infrastructure right here in Tucson. And I've done that by looking at documents and attending meetings and doing interviews. And it's a really fascinating story. This timeline captures a little bit of it. It's fascinating. Tucson is different from so many other cities because it wasn't really a top-down approach. Rather, it was bottom-up um, activists, 
community members, neighborhood associations started practicing by cutting curbs and kind of capturing the rainwater. And then you see this whole response from city government to pass ordinances and create plans and, and all sorts of things. So we've been studying this trajectory, like how it's happened, how it's played out over the last 20 years. And one of the things that we've noticed is that how green infrastructure is taken up in Tucson isn't always very equitable. So that is not all the parts of town benefit equally or not all citizens of Tucson benefit equally. So we've been part of this community project at a high school in the south side of Tucson. It's part of Sunnyside School District to actually study green infrastructure, to design it, to implement it, and to study it at their campus. And so you can see some of these photographs. It was pretty much a moonscape, and um, but with big roofs that could capture a lot of rainwater. So over the last number of years, we've been working with local NGOs and the school district to really realize the potential of green infrastructure at the school. So we've been engaging high school students, U of A undergrads, U of A graduate students, and a whole slew of community members in our efforts. So these top, this topic of green infrastructure and water policy here in Tucson is something that I do research on, but it's also something that I teach about in my classes. I primarily teach in the environmental studies major, which is a BA degree here at U of A. It's housed in the School of Geography, Development and the Environment, but it's made up of classes from all across the campus. There's a tremendous amount of choice and freedom in the major, but you students are required to take an intro course, which is this EVS 260 course, and they also take a capstone course. So there's like bookends for the course and then a whole bunch of freedom in the middle. So in this EVS course 260, it's very introductory. It's about environmental policy in the US and internationally. We do a lot of exploration into local groups and community issues. And then geography 302 is introduction to sustainability to sustainable development is another course that I teach. And this course is about cities and sustainability and how the challenges cities face and the innovation from cities. And we focus a lot on Tucson and green infrastructure, but other cities around the world as well. Um, we look at water, of course, but we look at transportation and housing and a whole bunch of other different sustainability issues. In both of these courses, I'm interested in the human dimensions and the, the, the dimensions of people, how environmental justice can be realized, how as a community we face inequity, we recognize inequity and we respond to it and we create new policies or new programs to adjust to it and what, what that looks like. Thanks so much. Thank you, Andrea. So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Brian Black. He's an associate professor in dendrochronology. Um, he applies dendrochronology techniques to growth increments formed in the hard parts of marine and freshwater species, including fish, bivalves, and corals. These aquatic chronologies are used to establish long-term patterns in productivity and their relationships to climate, to also to quantify long-term impacts of human activities and to hindcast climate prior to the start of instrumental records. Brian? Great, well, thank you very much for that introduction. And I'm glad to be here and speak to everyone today. And again, my name is Brian Black and I'm an associate professor at the Laboratory of Tree Ring Research. I'll go ahead and share my screen here with a few visuals. So let me get that started. And I'm originally trained as a dendrochronologist, but apply those tree ring techniques not only to trees, but also to long-lived marine and freshwater organisms. And I'm interested also in the linkages among marine freshwater and terrestrial systems. And um, you know, I was surprised when I began working in this area at how many organisms live a long time and also form annual growth increments. And so some examples uh, on the west coast of the US are these Pacific rockfish which can live to be upwards of 200 years as the oldest fish I ever caught. And this was out of the uh, Gulf of Alaska, at least of a rockfish. And they form these increments in, in their heads, this ear stone called an otolith. And it's about the size of a pea. And whenever you cut right through it, it looks like the cross section of a tree, like a tree stump. And it has all those annual increments that are very analogous to tree rings that we can analyze and use those rings as kind of a flight recorder that's, re that's a recording all the environmental variability that fish has experienced over the course of its lifespan. And we can do the same for freshwater fish that can live a very long time, 
we can do uh, marine uh, uh, clams also. The world's oldest animal is a clam, this Arctica islandica that was caught out of the North Atlantic was verified at 507 years old, so amazingly long-lived organisms. And you've probably heard also of, of tropical corals can live to be quite old also, several centuries. So as an example of what I do, uh, there's a, a project I'm working with, working on in the North Pacific with these long-lived clams called Pacific gooey duck, spelled G-E-O-D-U-C-K, but are, are pronounced gooey duck. And so these fish or these uh, clams live to be over 150 years old and burrow in the mud uh, where they're well protected. And they can be collected and we can section the holes right through the middle to uh, expose the growth increments. And here is an example of those growth increments in the goo. And look at those beautiful lines, just like tree ring. And we've sampled all these sites along the British Columbia and Washington coast and can put together the equivalent of tree ring chronologies using the same tree ring text, but for And so these provide a very long history of temperature. And in fact, the, the width of these rings corresponds to how warm it was in a given year. The relatively wide increments were formed during warm years and the narrow increments during cool years. You can see these periods of several years of cool temperatures followed by several years of warm temperatures as the North Pacific has oscillated between these warm and cool phases. And so with these gooey duck, we can go back 150 years with the living organisms and then send down divers to suck up dead gooey duck off the ocean floor and, and excavate these pits where they can dig out shells that go back over 2000 years. And we can use tree ring pattern matching techniques, the techniques developed by tree ring scientists to match patterns among these gooey duck can get a, a continuous history back over the past several hundred years. And then integrate those patterns with trees. Coastal trees also pick up signals of temperature from the ocean. And the trees and the clams together each tell us somewhat different stories so that we put them together and get a nice robust view of what temperature was like over the past several centuries. And here's an example from the Northeast Pacific from trees and clams, where the red line is the instrumental climate record and this black line is, is the history from the trees and the clams, and the gray is the uncertainty. But the point being is looking how far back in time we can go with the trees and clams as natural records of the climate and telling us a lot about the 20th century and providing context for the warming that we're seeing over this much longer interval. So overall, uh, my lab is, is applying these tree ring techniques uh, to trees so that we can learn about the ecology and climate and forests and linkages uh, with mussels in the river and their uh, growth increments and in the near shore with these bivalves and offshore with the fish and piece these linkages together and among these ecosystems to tell us how the ecosystems function and also what the climate was like prior to instrumental records. And I teach um, a couple classes at the university I'm teaching right now Global Change 170, GC 170, Intro to Global Change, which is a general education course. And then uh, for those interested later in your careers, I teach a dendrochronology workshop, which is sort of a research experience using tree ring data. And we uh, develop a unique uh, research project and, and um, explore that over the course of the semester, culminating in a group report. So it's, it's kind of an interesting way to gain research experience in tree ring data. And I would further encourage everyone to stop by the Library of Tree Ring Research, which is a very unique uh, resource on campus. And as we resume tours, is a, a wonderful experience for you to check out these research labs, see what we're doing. And if you'd like to even volunteer in a lab and get more experience with tree rings or these marine rings, please feel free to. All right, with that, I'll wrap it up. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Brian. Very interesting. Um, so uh, our next speaker uh, is Dr. Joellen Russell. She's the Thomas R. Brown Distinguished Chair of Integrative Science and a Professor of Geoscience with joint appointments in the Department of Lunar Departments of Lunar and Planetary Sciences, Hydrology, and uh, sorry, Hydrology and Atmospheric Sciences, and in the Math Department, uh, Mathematics Department. She's an oceanographer and she studies the role of ocean on climate. She uses global climate and earth system models to simulate the climate and carbon cycle of the past, the present, and the future. She teaches oceanography, a very popular gen, gen ed class, and has several upper division classes in the Department of Geosciences. 
Joella. Thanks, Jim. Welcome, welcome, everybody. I can't tell you how delighted I am to be here with all my colleagues in these amazing disciplines. Boy, as students, have you come to the right university if you are interested in the environment. No kidding. Aren't they amazing? They are amazing. Well, let me tell you a little bit about my, my major department is uh, in geosciences. And uh, they do everything from core to clouds and in between. And uh, uh, they're ranked top five in the country. They are just amazing. So come on in and see what we're up to. Uh, what I do is I'm uh, when I'm not teaching or uh, doing my research here at the University of Arizona, I'm I'm a working oceanographer, and uh, we don't have very many of those worldwide. Where there are only about six thousand PhD level oceanographers working in the world today, and you are living through a revolution in oceanographic research. We used to have to go to sea with these, and we still do, with these huge arrays. And it's easy to put one of those big arrays over on a good day. And they're pressure triggered bottles so that we can bring back up all these amazing water samples and do all of this amazing sampling. And it's very time intensive and extraordinarily expensive. So oceanographers are sneaky and amazing and they've come up with some options and one of those options is these floats micro sensors and better batteries hi becky that's becky beadling uh one of my students who is now off as a postdoctoral fellow in the most prestigious climate fellowship in the world the noaa climate and global change fellowship there she is deploying these floats and these floats are revolutionizing oceanography um, and one of the ways that we are looking at carbon in the ocean is a project that I lead the modeling for, which is our Southern Ocean Carbon and Climate Observations and Modeling. And it's primarily funded by the National Science Foundation with help from NASA and from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. But we have carbon censored floats that we left behind after these cruises doing our work for us. And they report back their data every time they come to the surface and they beam it back by Iridium satellite. And we put all that data online for anyone to use within two hours. This is amazing. Carbon, nutrients, chlorophyll, oxygen, things that we didn't ever think we could see. And yes, they're ice avoiding. So when they come up and they think they're gonna bang their head on the ceiling of the ice, they actually check their temperature sensor and go right back down. And by the way, this is Hannah Zanowski, who started in my big gen ed oceanography class and has just started her faculty position at the University of Wisconsin Madison. Yay, Hannah, woohoo! And our next project after this figuring out what's going on with the carbon in the ocean around Antarctica is the winds. They are incredibly intense around Antarctica and we're missing them. We're missing them because the current satellites that are up are just not able to sample often enough and at high enough waves, wind speeds actually figure out how hard it's blowing and how much the climate is changing in response to the increase in CO2. So I'm leading a proposal right out of the University of Arizona to put a satellite up through our Earth Venture mission proposal to NASA. And uh, yes, we're hiring undergrads to help work on both the proposal and hopefully also on the project. So we've got a whole array of University of Arizona folk from over in planetary sciences as well as here in geo and in the uh, Department of uh, uh, Hydrology and Atmospheric Sciences, and uh, it's going to be a hoot. We're putting it in this fall. Woohoo! And here's our logo, just in case anybody's interested in coming to work with us so that you can get some of the awesome swag as well as be paid. Yes, that is not a scotch bottle in, the, in the, that is actually a float. So, uh, and I just want to point out, I do teach GS2 and 2 intro to oceanography. We broke Zoom yesterday. We had like, or on, on Thursday, we had 484 students on at once. And uh, <clears throat> we're going to have to turn some cameras off. Woohoo! So, and I also teach uh, joint with Scott Seleska in the Ecology and Evolutionary Biology Department. We teach um, uh, GS uh, 478, 578 for when you get more advanced in your studies, which is uh, global change. So. Come on in, the water's fine. We'll be happy to see you. Boy, did you pick the right spot to come to. Thank you, Joelle. And yeah, so who, who would have thought that you could come to Tucson, Arizona in the middle of the desert to become an oceanographer? Uh, just check with Joellen. 
So uh, before I go on to Kevin, Kev, um, I'd like to just remind everyone to be looking into the chat because you'll f see uh, links to the breakout sessions and uh, which are really important. In fact, Diana um, it reminded us that the breakout sessions are an opportunity to meet some of the speakers and department heads, ask questions, learn more about courses and degrees, uh, and of course, meet other students. So yeah, please uh, don't forget to take a look at the various sessions and, uh, and then have that link ready because right after this, that's where you're gonna be headed. So uh, our next uh, speaker, uh, Kevin Antrokaitis, He's an prof associate professor in the School of Geography, Development, and Environment. He's a paleoclimatologist and a dendrochronologist and earth systems geographer who specializes in the reconstruction analysis and analysis of climate variability and change over the common era and the interaction between past climate and human society. Kevin? Thanks, Jim, and, and thanks to uh, everyone for being here. I'm gonna uh, share some slides here. So hopefully you should all see a, a really cool tree growing out of a temple in Cambodia. Um, this uh, this uh, temple has a date on it uh, from the seventh century. Um, and uh, we've been working for a number of years in Southeast Asia, trying to understand the link between uh, climate change, climate variability, human modification of the landscape, and the collapse of civilizations. Um, this is one part of the research I do. So as an earth system geographer, um, I study changes in the Earth system and the environment and in climate um, in both space and time. And as Joellen said before me, there's really no better university, I think, to study uh, the diverse set of topics that fall under this understanding of environment um, to get a picture of how we're changing the environment and how human civilization is being affected by climate environmental change. Now, like Brian, the tool that I use to do this is to go back in time and actually reconstruct past climate, past temperatures, uh, past ocean conditions, um, past rainfall, droughts, and floods. Um, now, once you've got this long-term perspective on the climate system and changes in the environment, you can start to understand how the climate system varies naturally on timescales from seasons uh, to years to decades to even millennia. Um, and you can really start to build up this understanding of, of the amazing things that the climate system can do. We've only been watching it with those sensors, uh, satellites, um, and instrumental data for a tiny little bit of time. But if you go back in time, you can see the amazing things the climate system can do. Um, now, naturally, when you go back through history and you're trying to reconstruct climate, you're gonna come to those moments where changes in past civilizations, past human society, and past climate met. And so a big part of our research and our work has been understanding how complex civilizations like ours uh, respond to these changes in climate and changes in environment, how they actually uh, created their own landscapes uh, and what the consequences of that were. And we call this broadly in geography coupled human natural systems. What are the feedbacks between the social systems that uh, we know and study um, and the physical climate? Um, so the coursework that I teach really uh, intersects almost all parts of the earth system. So here's a lovely volcano, one of my favorite things. Um, and I teach a, an intro level class, uh, Geography 170, Intro to Earth's Environments. Um, and we study all the good stuff. So climate change, sure, but uh, volcanoes, earthquakes, uh, changes in, in uh, life, extinction, uh, biogeography, um, how the ocean works, all these things are part of this intro class. Um, I also uh, teach classes more specifically on the climate system using both these records of past climate and present climate to understand how does this system work? And if we can understand better how the climate system works, how the earth system works, can we predict what's gonna happen in the future as we humans become a major force, not only in changing the atmosphere, but moving the land surface and actually changing the chemistry of the ocean. We are a major force in changing the earth system. What are the consequences of that going to be? And so even though my work has uh, intersected with understanding how past civilizations have responded to climate variability, as you uh, start to go around the world in our work in Southeast uh, Asia and Asia, um, in arid Central Asia, and particularly in Central America, what we've become increasingly concerned with is can we use our understanding of how the climate system works to uh, try and figure out how uh, these changes in the future, present and future, are going to impact things like food security, uh, water availability for really vulnerable populations. And so even though my Geography 230 class on our changing climate is largely about how the climate is changing and what ways it's uh, changing, we spend a good part of that class 
thinking about what are the impacts? Uh, how do we mitigate or adapt changes uh, to changes in, in the climate system? Um, this is an important part of, of the courses that I teach. And then ultimately, my work uh, is not only figuring things out about the past and the present, but how can we help communities adapt to the future, become less vulnerable and more resilient to the climate change that's coming? So that's a broad view of the things I do. I teach three classes, this uh, Geography 170, Intro to Earth's Environment, where we do pretty much everything, solid earth, atmosphere, ocean, and the living component of the earth system. Geography 230, our changing climate, zooms in on that atmosphere and ocean component, tries to understand how climate is changing and what the impacts will be. And then if you really like this stuff, I teach Geography 430, the climate system, where we really get into the intricacies of how the earth's climate system happens. Geography, though, is a great place to uh, get your degree if you're really interested in these interactions between human society and civilization and the physical environment and climate change. Uh, we offer uh, a BS in geography. This can include humans, uh, sorry, Earth systems geography. We also have a BA in geography. So if you're interested in the way that human and natural systems are coupled and how they feed back and what some of the consequences of environmental change are, this could be the degree for you. And if you really love uh, satellites and understanding uh, the spatial interactions and temporal changes uh, using programming and computer code and satellite data. We have a BS in geographic information systems technology for you too. So welcome to the University of Arizona. Uh, you really are in the best place possible to study uh, the environment. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, yes, there's a question. The, the, uh, the breakout sessions will be recorded um, as well. So uh, our next uh, speaker, Rachel Gallery, couldn't be with us, but she recorded for us. Um, Dr. Rachel Gallery is an associate director and professor in the School of Natural Resources and the Environment. She and her research group use ecological experiments, microbiological techniques, and contemporary genetic and metagenomic tools to test the effects of plant microbe interactions on plant and microbial communities. She teaches an undergraduate course in the fall, Natural Resource uh, Ecology, RNR 316, and Ecosystem Ecology, uh, RNR 458, 558, as well as graduate seminars uh, courses focus on above ground, below ground interactions, and current topics in microbial ecology. Hi there. My name is Rachel Gallery, and I'm an associate professor in the School of Natural Resources and the Environment. And I'm going to tell you about some of my research in an ecosystem that you might not have heard of before. So this photo behind me is a photo that I took in Suma Paz, Colombia, of an ecosystem called Paramo. Now, Paramo are montane grassland, wetland, and peatlands, and they're found throughout the tropical regions, but primarily in Colombia, Ecuador, and Venezuela. Uh, Paramo are located above treeline at about three to 4,000 meters, which is about 10,000 to 14,000 feet, uh, so much higher than the Mount Wrightson Peak, for example. And Paramo are biodiversity hotspots. There are an estimated 5,000 plant species in these areas, and more than 50% of these species are endemic to these ecosystems, meaning that they're only found in these ecosystems, so that if they go extinct here, they would go extinct globally. Wolves, uh, white-tailed deer, spectacled bears, and the Andean condor are just some of the animals that make Paramo their home. And Paramo provide many ecosystem services for us as well. They're being increasingly developed for agriculture, cattle grazing, and mining. And Paramo provide the crucial ecosystem service of drinking water to more than, I think it's about 6 million people in Colombia, Ecuador, and Venezuela. Glacial melt is one of the sources of this drinking water. And this is a video of melt that I took from Antisana in Ecuador. And in the distance here, you can see the glacier and the peak. And so we decided to start our trek. It didn't seem that far away. And here I am at about almost 14,000 feet and my lungs are bursting. And I'm thinking this might've been a bad idea, but we wanted to get there. And so we got up here, now we're standing in the glacier and you can see the Paramo way off in the distance here. And this is the glacial melt moving its way down this valley. And the snow and the ice pack here was very weak. We fell through in a number of places. And my colleague said that 
Um, the last time that they were here at about five years ago at the same time of year, this entire area was covered in ice and glacial ice. And so this is one of the obvious and grave consequences of climate warming. Now, a lot of the precipitation in Paramo comes in the form of mist and fog and freezing rain. You can see clouds that come in really quickly and then you're just left standing and shivering in this freezing uh, cloudy air. But the plants and animals of Paramo are adapted to this cold and wet climate. And so are the microorganisms that live in soils, which hold a dear place in my heart. That's one of the things that I like to study. So these cold and wet climates have resulted in low decomposition rates. And so over the millennia, this has resulted in a large buildup of soil organic matter, making Paramo one of the most important soil carbon sinks in tropical biomes. Uh, this is a photo of a soil pit that I took in this uh, particular Paramo system in the Sumapaz. And you can see this rich and dark organic layer, this rich dark organic horizon of soil, which is almost about five feet deep before you transition into these deeper horizons. So this is very carbon rich. But now Paramo are warming and they're drying. Just like the permafrost soils of the tundra, the soil carbon of the Paramo is threatened by climate warming. But Unlike the permafrost soils of the tundra, we know far less about how much carbon dioxide and methane and other gases are being released from these Paramo soils. And so here is a, an international network of scientists that includes botanists, watershed hydrologists, ecophysiologists, soil scientists, and ecologists who have developed these experimental warming plots. Those are the octagonal um, uh, structures that you see behind here um, that can warm up these plots up to four degrees Celsius. And so this experiment um, that I've been going on for years now allow us to make to make these measurements about how plants and soils are going to be responding to warming and then to use those to make predictions for what this means for photosynthesis and primary productivity or how microorganisms in the soils cycle and recycle nutrients and carbon and what that means for carbon emissions and whether warming is going to lead to a loss of particular species that are crucial for the ecosystem functioning and the services that we rely on. So this is some of the research that I'm involved in and I want to reiterate that science is about discovery. It is the iterative process of building knowledge and trying to uh, use what we learn in order to solve the environmental challenges that we face. And science can be especially rewarding when you make these discoveries with friends. It can also be a lot more fun. And so um, when I am not perfecting my selfie game, I teach R&R 316, Natural Resource Ecology. And this is a photo of our 2019 class after they had finished their semester long phenology project. I'm also one of the faculty in the new Global Change Ecology and Management option within the School of Natural Resources and the Environment. So please go to our website or please feel free to get in touch with me if you have any questions or are interested in learning more about our programs. So thank you for your time. Well, thank you, Rachel. Uh, so uh, just checking, uh, Maya, our next speaker was coming from actually another meeting and uh, Monica Ramirez Andreota, is she in yet? So we're going to ask uh, uh, Monica. Um, uh, to, in a minute, show her slides. I'm going to introduce her. Monica Ramirez Andreota um, is an assistant professor in the Department of Environmental Science. She leads a research team that focuses on how environmental pollution affects health risks in different communities in the Southwest, including the disproportionate impact of pollution on poorer communities. Last year, she received the Early Career Award for Public Engagement with Science from the, with, with Science from the American Association for the Advancement of Science in recognition of her effective engagement of impacted communities in environmental research and for her efforts on behalf of environmental justice. Monica. Thank you all so very much. It is great to be here. Um, I will now be sharing uh, my slides to go through and highlight a couple items. 
from my research program. Alrighty. Yes. Okay, here we go. So uh, I'm going to be talking about today designing, or very briefly, just designing community science to achieve environmental health justice. Projects that I currently lead are Garden Roots and uh, Project Harvest, and my lab logo is in the center where you see that we have the environment, we see uptake patterns in the soil, we see plants, and then we see that fist of like, yes, we can achieve justice. Moving right along, we can see uh, what do I do? And so it's important, like with environmental science, it already is encompasses many different disciplines. So it's a very exciting field to be in because you get to work in a space where you can bring together different disciplines to solve issues. And so in this case, right, I have an environmental science background, public health background, I have an art degree, and so I very much work in visual communication in the photographic arts, as well as sociology where I did my postdoc. But I just described how I might identify myself in an academic setting. Let's talk about who I am, right? So I'm uh, Mexican American, my Nana is the one, this is my aunt, uh, my Nana and her sisters. My Nana is the one in the upper right corner. I was born and raised in Tucson, Arizona, as well as uh, in parts of Mexico going back and forth as well as being a athlete, someone very silly, but completely dedicated to the Southwest and my community. When I, so with the research program and what we do is environmental health and climate justice for all is the core goal of all of this work. If we think about what that framework means, it's a framework that helps us understand, that helps us understand what is contributing to and producing unequal environmental protection. So it will require ethics and it requires a new way of producing data. If we go even further, more detail, right, using this framework, uh, students and myself in the lab are looking at environmental contamination, food quality, ways to improve soil and air quality, how to communicate environmental risk data, doing data visualizations through graphic design and other types of non-traditional data and art forms, at, and then within the core of justice for all is a public participatory approach to scientific research, recognizing that we can all work together to generate a data set. Uh, this is just highlighting what the major components are in the lab of public participation, peer education and information design. And if we look at a bird's eye view of how this might play out in the lab, you can see that we start with a community concern. We move all the way through community trainings, from then sample analysis, translating the results, drafting ways to communicate results to uh, communities, and then coming up with new questions. And so with this design, we're able to address community concerns, report data back to families, and co-generate a data set to inform families and environmental policy and decision making. What I want to end with is just a reminder to be committed to lifelong learning, right? We think that this pathway is linear and clear cut, and it is not. Uh, as we can see here with these great graphics, and recognizing that your knowledge is power, that you can represent the needs of your community to develop solutions, you can advocate for what you believe in, and you want to have a, a place at the decision-making table, and that is exactly why you are here at college, and we're so grateful to have you. And, um, and so highlighting what you can do within uh, the environmental science degree, we see here, right, we have a BS in environmental science. It's very exciting to be working with the students, undergraduates in this department. And I, the courses that I be teach are environmental uh, ecosystem health and justice, uh, translating environmental science, reclamation and redevelopment of, of impacted land. I lead the colloquium series to bring in scholars from around the world now that we have to go online, and then as well as a exposures, health impacts, and risk from co um, contaminated sites. And that's another type of seminar colloquium. And with that said, thank you all so very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Monica. Uh, it's great to have you. So um, <laughs> we will, um, we're gonna wrap up here now. So I, uh, and in, in doing so, I wanna thank all the presenters uh, for really fascinating and inspiring pres presentations. Frankly, it makes uh, me wanna go back to school. I'd like to thank uh, the C's uh, heads, or my C's colleagues uh, who uh, pulled this all together and invited their colleagues to come and present. Uh, and a special thanks to Professor Diana Liverman, who's the director of the School of Geography, Development and Environment, who had this brilliant idea. Uh, also, Maya Patterson and Elena Lauder for helping make the, the whole webinar thing uh, seamless. 
So I, I'd like to invite everyone to go back, go on to the chat, take a look at it. Don't forget to move now uh, very quickly. We have two minutes into our break room of your choice. And thank you again, everyone. This is a really a wonderful opportunity to meet all of you and hear from you.